I see a few of our regular names in here, which is always great. Thank you for joining us again. And it looks like we are live. Let's just confirm that. Yes, we are live. So welcome to everybody who's attending right now. It's great to see you again. Um, tonight, we have a fun-filled program, again, from California, starring some of our great wines. Uh, and this one will be focusing also on a uh, vineyard that has had five successful generations over in California of growing grapes and making wine. So it's exciting to see. As you know, we are operating uh, 90 days around the world with the New Hampshire Liquor Commission. So thank you for joining us. Uh, during that time, you can actually attend these events either through Zoom or watch on Facebook Live. If you have registered and attended through Zoom, you are also eligible to receive any of our specials and promotions. So it's always good to do so. So check out our Zoom page. Um, in addition, if you go to the Eventbrite page or the 90daysaroundtheworld.com site, so that's 90daysaroundtheworld.com, you'll also see an invitation to join us on Scavify, which is a scavenger hunt program. And that application will let you collect points and rewards as well for attending these various events and doing uh, various fun things. So be sure to check that out. Tonight, we have a few characters with us. We have Nikki Wente from Wente Vineyards. We have Christian Perrone, who is one of the representatives here in New Hampshire, and Chad Gibson, who is the wine specialist and buyer in New Hampshire, who you'll see on here for the rest of the month. So welcome all. And Nikki, I'll let you do your introductions. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, so I am Nikki Wente. Um, I'm going to put on a little PowerPoint just with photos, no words, or there's a couple words, but you can ignore them. Um, I'll speak to those. But uh, just to kind of show you guys um, a little bit about what Wente Vineyard is and um, who we are, where we came from, what we do, uh, and tell you guys a little bit about our family's history. So as Sean mentioned, I am a fifth generation wine grower and my actual role at my family business is the viticulture manager and vineyard manager. So I um, basically am a farmer. That, that's what I do for a living. I'm a farmer. Uh, I make a little tiny bit of wine, uh, but not too much of that. Uh, mostly just focused on the vineyards, vine health, fruit quality, and how I can continuously improve every year on not only the quality of the fruit, but also the sustainability of our production. So that's kind of what I do. Um, I should probably check. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Head nods. I like it. Um, all right. So um, who are we besides who I am? So we are Wente Family Estates, Wente Vineyards. We're at five generations. So we were started back in 1883. And on this page here, you can see every Wente family member that has been involved in the business. So I think something that's been really important to me as I grow up in this wine family is that there was never any pressure to join this business. It was, if you love it as much as we love it, you're welcome to apply for a job. And if you're the right candidate, we'll accept you. Um, but if you are not interested or if you're not the right candidate, I'm sorry, it's not for you. Um, but it's always made me more passionate about it because it's never felt like something that's forced. And you can see through five generations, there really hasn't been all that many different family members involved. So kind of an interesting first look at, at who we are. Um, but right now we are operating in the fourth and fifth generation. So my father and his brother and sister are both involved, um, as well as in our fifth generation, I'm with my, si my sisters and two of my cousins. So it's a really fun business to be in, but I'll get back to the beginning of the story and tell you guys a little, little bit about Mr. C.H. Wente. So Carl Wente, he is my great-great-grandfather and he came over to the United States from Germany in 1881. Um, he was a farmer in Germany before he left, and he came out actually looking for his two stepbrothers that had came out to the United States probably uh, 15 years prior to him. So he was in his mid-20s when he came out and was just looking around to see where his brothers were. He actually found out that they had both passed away um, and decided, you know, I'm here, I'm going to go out to California. So arrived on East Coast, went all the way out to California, and was able to get a job with a Mr. Charles Krug 
I don't know if anyone's heard of that winery, but they are still open today up in Calistoga in the Napa Valley. Um, and Charles Krug was also a man from Germany, starting out in California, had a beautiful estate, a beautiful winery, lots of vineyards, lots of wines. Um, so he was able to kind of put my, my great great grandfather under his wing and teach him everything he knew about winemaking and growing grapes. And after just over a year, uh, car, excuse me, <laughs> I talk kind of fast. So hope everyone's staying with me. Um, uh, just after a little over a year, my great great grandfather, Carl, felt like he was ready to go take on the world himself. So after kind of looking around Napa a little bit, he decided to keep his search of where his perfect property was. And shortly after that, he um, received a call from a good friend who asked if he wanted to be a 50% partner in a piece of land in the Livermore Valley. And he had never heard of the place. So he came down and uh, after looking at the location, it was right next to San Francisco, just about 20 miles east of the bay, um, was directly on a rail line. The railroad went right through Livermore. So it was like, perfect. If you're going to grow grapes and make wine, you could ship it out to San Francisco so easily. The rail line is right there. Um, and the, the best part about this was the 49 acres they were looking at was already planted to vineyard land. So immediately they could start growing grapes, which that doesn't happen very often because if you plant a vineyard now, it takes three years before you get your first fruit. Um, so back then it probably even took longer because they didn't have drip irrigation. They just were dry farming and without water, you didn't, don't get quite as much growth, especially from those young vines. Um, so with an already established vineyard, he was able to immediately jump into that project and start making wine and um, being the on-site vineyard manager. So um, his 51% or whatever uh, uh, purchase into this property was he also was living on the property, making the wine himself and growing the grapes himself. And uh, the man that was a partner with him was actually a doctor in town. So they kind of did this business trade. And after a couple of years, my great grandfather, or great great grandfather um, decided that, you know, I want to I want to be in this venture on my own and ended up buying out the rest of the, the land and starting to increase the land that he farmed. Um, he always wanted to be a farmer first and care for the land, really build up a beautiful fruit, uh, beautiful vines and create that high quality wine in the bottle. And he always said that it started from the soil. And if you don't pay attention to your soil, then you're forgetting about your insurance policy because that is where everything comes from. Um, so Mr. Charles here with, excuse me, I keep going back to Charles Krug. <laughs> Mr. Carl here with his wonderful mustache had a, big family. Um, they ended up having 10 kids, seven of which survived. Um, and of this family, only two of the boys wanted to be involved in the wine business. Um, so those two boys are, we have on the left-hand side, Ernest, and then in the white little, what looks kind of like a dress here, that's Herman on his mother's lap. Um, so we have a lot of these fun old photos that I, I love so much because you can really see how much everyone loved photos back then. <laughs> All the wonderful smiles. Um, but it just kind of goes to show you that back then they were using barrels just like we are today, maybe a little bit bigger in some cases. Ours are more like the barrel that they have the wine seated on. Um, but really what we, we always wanted to do was kind of put that quality in the bottle, make sure everyone's getting a taste of our terroir and have the most wonderful experience with their friends and family while drinking our wines. So from this generation, we have our second and third. So from the first generation of our family members, Carl, Carl Sr. had a Carl Jr. <laughs> and then from there, there was a Carl III. And that is the young strapping man on the left here. Um, he was the only child from that generation, from that second generation. There was a big uh, fever that came through Livermore Valley back in the early 1900s. And it made all of the family unable to have children except for Ernest, who was the one taking care of everyone at the time. So just a little interesting fact, but that's why in our third generation, there's only one person. So it was sort of up to Carl to take on the ropes of the wine business and continue pursuing it. 
Um, and thank God he did, or else he wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for uh, my grandfather, Carl. Um, so what Ernest and Carl really did together, um, Herman was the winemaker, so Herman's over there on the right, uh, and Ernest and Carl together decided that they wanted to expand greater and greater. Um, they both were interested in farming more acres to increase production within the winery, and with the two of them working together, they were able to get to uh, about a thousand acres in Livermore and um, about 600 acres down in Monterey. So those two partnered together to purchase the property in Monterey and get it transitioned from walnuts into um, grapes. Uh, so those are kind of the, the two big things that those guys did together, as well as um, getting water for our valley in Livermore. We did not have any water coming through and it was Carl who was instrumental in kind of developing an entire canal that comes through the state of California all the way through Livermore and down into San Jose area. So because of that canal, we're able to irrigate all of our vineyards with surface water rather than digging into groundwater. Um, and for those that know, groundwater in California is very precious. There's not very much of it. So um, we're really thankful to Carl for his ingenuity in trying to get that all scheduled because they, they were already going to send the water to um, San Jose area, but they didn't necessarily have to come through Livermore and he really lobbied for that one. Um, and so that's why, that's why we're still in business today in Livermore. So we're very thankful for him on that one. Uh, and then here you can see Carl and uh, Ernest with Two of the boys. Uh, my father is the one out, reaching out and my uncle is the other the other boy there on his father's lap. Um, and this I love this picture so much because you can really see the difference in grape, grape vines back there. We did not irrigate our vineyards still at this point. They were all head trained which means that it's just a single vine in the ground that kind of comes out like a bush whereas now you see them very prim and proper up straight usually in some sort of vertical position um, with all of the shoots very tucked into wires and all that sort of thing but back then it was just kind of like a big tree on the ground <laughs> that you went and picked at the end of the season um, so much has changed since these early days of our grape growing but uh, what has stayed the same is that we keep our focus first on how to preserve the earth how to preserve the soils and how to grow the best quality grapes as well as keeping a sustainable relationship with our community and with our employees. And then today, you can really see the change here because we switched to color photo. Um, so this is some of the family members that are in today. We're only missing my, uh, my middle sister. She joined the business after this and we just haven't had a time to get together and take another photo. Um, but it's, it's kind of fun to go through the, the family line and see some old photos to new and uh, what's changed. So this is who we are, you know, we're a group of family members that really loves wine and loves doing what we do to bring a smile to people's face, bring people together, have deep, meaningful conversations over a wonderful glass of wine um, or enjoy your favorite food with a beautiful glass of wine. That's, that's what we love to do. Um, so to tell you, oh, and finally, I'll tell you a little bit about where we're at. Uh, so this is the Livermore Valley and this is the Livermore Valley back in 1906. Um, you can see that, <laughs> hopefully you guys can see this. I know it might be a little grainy on a computer screen, but we have a horse drawn buggy that is tilling the soil in the vineyard. And that's how we used to do things. So not super efficient, um, but I think it's a really cool example of just kind of what the valley looks like. And to give you a contrast, this is almost the exact same camera angle of the valley today, just a little bit more south. So. This is what our valley looks like today. These are our vineyards today. Uh, a lot tighter spacing. I'm sure you can tell between the vines. Um, they're not quite as spread out. I don't think we could fit a horse and a buggy down those rows anymore. But this is the Livermore Valley, um, for those of you don't, who don't know. And the Livermore Valley is uh, just east of San Francisco. So here's the San Francisco Bay here. Here's San Francisco. And here's the Livermore Valley. Uh, we have a slight rocky mountain range that separates us from San Francisco. And what that does is it actually directs the wind right into one location within the Livermore Valley. And because there's another mountain range on the east side of the Livermore Valley, 
um, it's kind of like a vacuum effect. So we are this little low spot between two mountain ranges and the bay. And on the other side of the far east mountain range is really, really hot temperatures. Like in the summer, it'll get up to like 110. You know, it's like Arizona out there. And then when you get over to San Francisco in the summer, it doesn't get past 68. So really different temperatures. And we're kind of right in this middle zone where in Livermore, it gets up to like 95 on a really hot day. And then the San Francisco wind comes through really nicely, vacuums out with the hot air from the Tracy area over on the east side, and it pulls the cold air from San Francisco all the way up and it cools us down so quickly. So Livermore has a huge diurnal temperature shift. And what that means is it gets pretty warm during the day, but it'll drop really cold at night. And that's awesome for grape growing. It helps to retain acidity in the wines. You know, when you have a, a sip of wine and it just kind of tastes flat, like that's because there's not enough acid and this natural diurnal shift is really what gives you great acid. So super, super great for the, that wind coming through. And also just that proximity to the bay allows us to have a really nice morning fog layer that comes in that clears out pretty much every day by 9 a.m. If, if there is any fog, it's gone by nine. Um, and we probably see fog about 50% of the time. All right, now get ready, prepare yourself, you guys. We're moving down south. So about two hours south of us is where we decided to spread our venture and that's down in Monterey. So for those who don't know, Monterey is um, about like 110 miles from San Francisco. Uh, and it is a nice little cove, a bay here. And Basically, Monterey is a fog area. All day long, there's fog. Uh, and that's no different than the Arroyo Seco Appalachian where we are. So it's not quite as um, close to the bay in terms of a wind pattern. So the wind pattern will come down this purple shoot that you see here, but it is closer to the ocean as the crow flies than Livermore is really close to the ocean. There's just this huge mountain range that does not leave room for any wind to come directly this way. So you're only gonna get wind patterns coming straight down that Monterey Bay Canyon there. Um, but in the Arroyo Seco, we have really great rocky soils. They're actually known as Arroyo Seco potatoes because they're these giant white rock soils. Um, and we uh, are very cold there, you know, it doesn't really get warm. There's fog that hangs out until about 1 p.m. and it might break for a couple hours and then the wind rolls in and it gets cold again. Um, Monterey is quite cold. So we grow our Pinot Noirs and one of our Chardonnays down there. We have a Riesling that's grown down there, but some of those cooler climate wines do really well in that area. And personally, it's one of my favorite locations to buy Pinot Noirs from because it has just a really beautiful, rich earthiness that comes through, but it still has enough heat hours in the day that you can still get that nice, beautiful fruit that we love in California. Um, so we purchased this property in 1962 because we were a little worried we were going to be uh, priced out of Livermore, actually. So we had about a thousand acres at that time, maybe a little bit more, maybe closer to 200 that were planted, 2000 or, plant, or, 2000, or uh, excuse me, 1500. Um, in Livermore planted and we had a lot of cattle land and they, uh, the government actually started taxing all land as if it were for its best use. So um, a beautiful chateau or a, a beautiful house or a mansion would be taxed the same as a, a grazing land for a cow, which that's insane. Uh, there's just no way to survive because you can't make as much money on a piece of land that a cow is sitting on, as you could, that there's a beautiful castle on, you know? Uh, so we were like, ah, oh, this is getting a little crazy here in the Bay Area. Let's go look for somewhere else that's more conducive to farming. Um, and through that, we found Arroyo Seco. And there was only a couple vineyards there at the time, but mostly lettuce and other types of farms. And we were like, ah, oh, maybe the soil is too rich for us here. So we looked around for a little while. And then we found as you got closer to the river, there was really nice well-drained soils, not too thick, not too over, um, over nutrient rich soils because those will, if your soil's too nutrient rich, you'll have way too much growth, uh, way too much vegetation and the fruit won't taste very good because it, there's no um, focus from the energy of the plant on the fruit because it's all going towards, let's keep growing. We have so much nutrients. 
Um, so we found that there's properties available for sale right along the river and they're absolutely perfect for growing some of these cooler climate grapes and kind of brings us back to our German roots a little bit because there's a lot of Riesling in Germany and a lot of Pinot Noirs in Germany. Um, so it was great to kind of have that, um, that ability to plant some cooler climate grapes. Um, and from there, we ended up finding out that they changed all the laws in Livermore and we were able to stick around, but that only made it better because we, Livermore is our home and we wanted to stay. It was just one of those, like, what are we going to do? We have to kind of stay in front of this and be ingenuitive when we can. And a lot of other players in the wine industry were going through the same thing, like the Mirasus, um, and we went down there with quite a few people looking for a new home. And luckily, we all... Um, lucked out from the Bay Area kind of changing those regulations. But a lot of those people, a lot of those key players are still in the Arroyo Seco area today. So it's great to have some neighbors that you've been um, on this, this fun hunt with for many years. Um, but yeah, so that kind of tells you a little bit about where we are. So between Livermore and Arroyo Seco, and we are going to be drinking wines from both places. So you guys will get to have a little taste of the difference between Livermore and Monterey, especially comparing the two Chardonnays. I think it's always pretty fun to do. Um, and so for those that are tasting with me, we'll just jump right in to tasting. And this is what we do. So uh, we're going to start out with the Morning Fog Chardonnay from Livermore. I personally love this because it's a screw cap and I love screw cap wines. I think you guys have screw caps, right? Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> um, but screw caps are some of my favorites, especially for a Chardonnay that's just a really good everyday wine. Um, so always excites me when I have a bottle of Morning Fog. But really what I love about this wine is that I think it shows off the Livermore Valley perfectly. And as I mentioned earlier, there is some Morning Fog, whereas Arroyo Seco, it's the all-day fog, but that wasn't quite as catchy of a name, so we, we thought we'd stick with just the morning fog, um, and what I really, I think it just shows Livermore off really well. When you're smelling it, you get like maybe some, a little bit of lemon, but you're starting to get into like a, a nice uh, like Fuji apple. It's just beautifully fruit forward, and I, I think it just does a nice job at showing that diurnal shift when you get that flavor. So I'm going to take a sip. I know it's only like 3.30 here, but you guys are all at like 6.30. So I'm going to pretend that I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, so I, I love the acidity on it. I think it just has a really nice round mouthfeel that kind of sucks in at the end and just gives you just um, almost like a honeysuckle flavor to finish off, um, which makes me just so excited. I, I'm a Chardonnay girl through and through, um, and I can explain that a little bit after letting everyone enjoy their wine that's drinking along with me. Um, but this wine is uh, about 50% aged in barrel, 50% in stainless steel. And we do that because we like to balance a little bit of acidity with the, uh, the freshness of the acidity from a wine that does not go through malolactic fermentation, which is our stainless steel portion, to the nice richness and buttery flavors that you're going to get from the oak aid goes through that malolactic fermentation. So the malolactic fermentation is the second fermentation, and wine doesn't have to go through it. Every red wine does, but white wines, they don't have to, but you can. And what it does is it just increases the complexity, changes the dimensions of the wine, adds more richness to it. Um, so in this wine, we do about 50% non-mallow, 50% mallow, and that 50% are in stainless or in oak. Um, and that's kind of where you get nice richness, but also really good acidity. Um, so not only is it kind of showing off some different winemaking techniques, but it also really does a good job at kind of showing off that Livermore Valley terroir, that uh, beautiful diurnal shift that's creating that nice acid in there. Nikki, so to, you as a, a breakup between our first Chardonnay and our second Chardonnay. Oh, is there a question? Sorry. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. It's okay. Oh, um, so you're showing a, a picture of a 1936 Pinot Chardonnay. Uh, Merith is asking if there's um, anything special about the photo. Yes, absolutely. So um, we have been growing Chardonnay since 1908. 
Um, we actually found some Chardonnay next door at a neighbor house, our neighbor's vineyard, and we were interested in trying out. We'd never planted it before, um, and they had it, so we went and grabbed some wood from them. Grapevine, planting grapevines is easy. You literally just take a piece of wood and you stick it in the ground, and all of a sudden the next spring it's growing. Don't tell anyone that I said that because I don't want to lose my job. But, <laughs> but truly, it is pretty easy to get a grapevine started. Um, so we were able to contact our neighbors. They gave us as much wood as we wanted. So we planted that. And after our first vintage in 1912, uh, my grandfather, great, great grandfather, loved it so much. He actually sent his son Ernest to France and asked him to bring more Chardonnay back. And so from there, um, we were just continuing to grow our stockpile of Chardonnay. And by 1920, when our favorite part of American history happens and we go into alcohol no more um, for prohibition, we were actually able to partner with Bull U Winery as the white wine supplier for sacramental purposes. So for all of the churches in the state, we were providing the white wine. Um, so unlike most people in the state of California, we were planting more Chardonnay during Prohibition while everyone else was ripping out whatever they had and either planting heavy, hardy varieties that you could ship because home winemaking was still allowed um, and people still ate grapes also. So people were making, either changing what they were planting or ripping it all together, growing something else or switching to cattle, you know, a lot of different things um, that farmers did to try and sur survive during that time. Um, but we were actually continuing to grow our Chardonnay. So, once prohibition ends and people start making wines again, uh, California started getting a really bad rap, really, really bad rap. Um, and what that was because it's all of those hearty grape varieties that we, people were changing over to, they weren't being honest about what was in the bottle. They were just like slapping some Chateau name on the bottle of wine and saying like, this is gonna be Chateau, um, I'm next door neighbor and <laughs> this wine is gonna knock your socks off, but it was made with really poor quality grapes um, that didn't produce great wines. So uh, actually in 1932, we decided as a family, you know what, we're gonna put Sauvignon Blanc on the label. And that was just unheard of, people didn't do that. And you can see when you're looking at wines from other countries, most other countries don't do it either, especially old world stuff like in France and, um, Germany, uh, a lot of those places, you're not gonna find the variety labeled on the bottle. But we knew that people were really scared to buy California wines. And this is something we could do to tell our consumer, hey, you know what's in the bottle here. You know it's a high quality grape. Like we are telling you at Sauve Blanc, have this. And that was such a huge success for us. We decided to start broadly labeling all of our wines. and. That's when we, in 1936, varietally labeled our Chardonnay. They called it Pinot Chardonnay back in the day uh, because Chardonnay and Pinot are genetically linked, but um, we dropped the Pinot to try and prevent any further confusion. Um, and back then we, we labeled it, we put it out there and people around California started tasting our Chardonnays and growers started saying, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, and why that happened was because when Ernest was growing his, his blocks of Chardonnay, what he was going through was tasting the berries during the ripening process and marking the vines that had the best flavors, the highest extract extractable flavors that he could taste. He was marking those vines and those were the vines that he was reproducing from. So he would only expand his grape supply from the vines that had the best flavors. So our Chardonnay had a really beautiful flavor profile because Ernest put all of his heart and soul into producing the best quality grapes that could come from the Chardonnay grapes we had on property. Um, so after everyone's tasting our wines and they're loving our Chardonnay, they came to our property and asked for wood. And we started handing out wood left and right. We worked with UC Davis to try and create clean wood because there were some some issues with uh, virus within the wood. So just like humans, grapevines can get viruses. Um, so specifically what we had in ours was stem pitting, which creates little, um, like almost like divots with inside the, the berry, or excuse me, inside the wood of the vine. Um, and we had leaf roll, which is another uh, virus that's transmitted through the xylem and creates some color issues in your leaves, but not such a big deal in Chardonnay. 
Um, so we, we tried to clean up the wood with UC Davis. We passed out wood the left and right. And today uh, it's actually about, I think it's around 70 to 75% of Chardonnay planted in California is actually descended from that block that Ernest spent all his time you know, trying to pick out the best flavors. So this bottle of wine did us some real good because we were able to spread the word about not only varietal labeling to get your consumer to trust you, but also to bring back some really great Chardonnays into the state of California and have some really amazing winemakers using what they now call the Wenty clone. Long-winded answer. <laughs> Very good answer, though. I don't know everybody knows the connection between Pinot and Chardonnay in terms of the grapes, but um, good answer because a couple more people had asked that same question. Um, somebody else who's online with us is drinking um, Eric's Unoaked Chardonnay 2018. Ooh. And so one of their questions is, can you talk about your small lot wines, which you have an enormous number of. So I, I don't know if you want to taste the next Chardonnay and then talk about some of the small lots and, and go from there. Perfect. Yeah, I can absolutely do that. Um, so our next Chardonnay is our Riva Ranch Chardonnay. So it's a single vineyard and it's our Monterey Chardonnay. And I love, this is my, this is my baby. I love this wine. Um, it is what I like to think of as like a really nice, big, buttery Chardonnay that doesn't lose the fruit. So, and I think that's all due to to being in Arroyo Seco. Arroyo Seco has the longest growing season for Chardonnay out of the state of California. So we don't pick this this grape until October or November based on how long it's taking to ripen. And it's not because we're getting it super ripe. We pick these almost at the exact same sugar level, maybe like a half of a brick, um, which is a percentage or it's one gram to a hundred gram or hundred milliliters of solution. So a little confusing, but we just go by bricks. <laughs> but maybe same or a little bit more sugar, but not too much. And the sugar all gets dried out during the fermentation process. But um, what it really relates to is the alcohol. It just takes forever to ripen there because it's, there's no heat days, you know, it's always the standard temperature that goes through and through. Uh, and so this wine develops flavors on the vine just so long and so beautifully. And I think that's why it can stand up to a little bit more oak than something like our morning fog could. Morning fog is wonderful and beautiful, but I think with it doesn't have the same fruit impact that you're going to get from something from Monterey. Uh, and that's why I really, really, really love this wine because I love my, I love myself some oak, but I also really love the, the flavor of Chardonnay, the fruit flavors. So I don't want to lose it all to oak and, or make it seem like I'm masking something with the oak. Um, so my dad, whenever he drinks this wine, always says to me that, to him, it smells like oily banana. And I have still to this day, never understood that one, but I always think it's a funny comparison. I'm like, I think passion fruit. And he's like, yeah, oily banana. And I'm like, no, nope, not what I meant by passion fruit. But when I'm drinking this, I can almost get creme, creme brulee at the end. Like it's just something so rich and beautiful, but still has that really nice fruit flavor that comes forward, maybe like papaya, um, just, I, I'm, I love this wine and I hope you guys do too. <laughs> There's quite a few people actually commenting online. Um, Meredith, who mentioned earlier the 1936 bottle, she also says that when she was doing some tastings for Wenty, the, um, she described the Riva Ranch Chardonnay as a perfect balance of oak and butter. So that was her, her comparison. And then we have an interesting one. Zach is asking, this almost sounds like a plant, so you'll have to let us know. Do you have a nickname for someone that likes the Riva Shard? Oh, yes, <laughs> we do. We, uh, we call them Riva Divas. Um, my mom is like the, the committee chapter leader of this group. <laughs> and my dad's close behind her, you know. Um, and we, uh, we were doing a Instagram live or something and someone was like, could the boys be Riva Stevas? <laughs> like, absolutely, whatever you guys want to be. Um, but I just, there's a lot of, uh, my mom and her friends that we've been making fun of for years in the in a loving fashion. I'm a Riva Diva myself. Maybe not when I was making fun of her the first time when I was like 16, but now I know, I understand. <laughs> That's great. It's always fun to see the inside scoop. So Zach, you can change your screen name right now if you want, or we can leave it Zach for now. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Riva Diva. Everyone, once you start drinking this, you turn into one and you can't help it. <laughs> 
So it, and it's just important to know, obviously, everything that we're tasting tonight is in our stores right now. Um, Chad can certainly comment in terms of availability and pricing and, and his own taste flavors on it, um, but they are all available, as well as some of the other small lots like the Eric's on, on Oak that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I can talk about our small lots a little bit as well. So um, we have two main kind of sectors of our winery, and it's our um, production wines that we can we sell out to most groceries or um, a lot of different states. And then we have the small lots that are a lot harder to come by. And I think it's really cool that you guys are able to get Eric's because that is another one of my favorite wines. It's just so fresh and I um, personally don't drink very much Sauv Blanc. So it's a, a really nice balance when I'm not feeling like I want something oaky or big, but I do want a Chardonnay that's nice and crisp. Um, my uncle Eric has always loved uh, the Chablis style of wine. So he challenged his son, Carl, to go after something that's not quite as rich, not quite so California, but um, it kind of sets our own sort of Chablis style. Don't go straight Chablis, but do something that I don't really love. And how he did that was by going in and using a concrete egg. So it still has some oxygen transfer rather than like a stainless steel tank. There is no oxygen transfer there, but um, concrete eggs are porous. You get some air in, uh, or excuse me, not porous. Um, there's, they have like cavities. So when you put it in, there's air displacement that's coming out. So there's actually no air transfer, um, but there is displacement that happens and it almost like naturally mixes the wine and gets some nice oxygenation in. Um, from those concrete eggs. So really cool wine and super cool that you guys are able to, to share that one out there in, in New Hampshire. But um, we also have a ton of other small lot wines. We have our artist series, which is my personal favorite. And all of the uh, labels are made by a local artist that applies, or we kind of do like usually a little competition and people send in some, some works that they might want to do. And then we select an artist and they're able to um, display their art in our tasting rooms all year long and people are able to purchase uh, pieces of their art. And we also have their, lab, uh, their artwork on our bottles of wine for a year. So that one's one of my favorites. Um, and then we have our Nth Degree series, which is my cousin Carl's uh, baby, which he started in 2002, uh, just wanting to make the highest quality wines from Livermore and really putting every effort into farming practices and how can we improve everything we do to make this wine perfect. Um, so that one's fun to farm because I get to challenge myself every year for how can I improve this wine? How can I continue to step up to the next level of farming to make this the perfect wine? Um, so I love the nth degree for that purpose and because it also tastes incredible. <laughs> but that one's usually harder to come by, not quite as uh, readily available in groceries. <laughs> well, it looks like when uh, travel opens up, everybody should head out to Livermore and, and have a visit over at Wente because when I was looking online, uh, it looks like you have a couple restaurants, a golf course. So you look like you're ready to entertain everybody. Yeah, I, we, uh, I should have probably mentioned that. Thanks for bringing it up. So we have a couple tasting rooms in Livermore and uh, one of them is our, our second winery, Myriad as well. And that was started by my dad in 1990 with a good friend, Sergio Traverso, who is the winemaker then. Um, and it's beautiful wines. Um, so that tasting room has food and beautiful wines. And it's a gorgeous tasting room that was actually a gravity flow winery in um, the 1800s for a Mr. Louis Mel. Um, and then they sold us the property in 1960. And in 1980, we fixed it up. And then in 1990, opened the winery. So really beautiful estate there. And then we have our home tasting room, which also serves food. It's a restaurant itself. And we have concerts right outside of that tasting room. Um, there's an event center. We also have our golf course on that property. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. So we are a wine country getaway experience. I can't wait for things to open back up so that we can welcome everyone to, uh, to our estate. So I noticed it's it's not in New Hampshire, unfortunately, but I did notice it besides an Eric's, there's also a Nikki's Pinot Noir. So you'll have to tell us about that. Is that your personal doing? Yeah, so I totally forgot about that also. I, I think I mentioned I make a little wine. <laughs> 
I'm mean, just getting back from the new year, you know, you're still trying to figure out what, what way is up? Are, like, are my feet moving or <laughs> am I seated? Um, so I made, I started making Nikki's in 2018 and it's kind of a partner to Eric's. So we had a, a rosé before, but we were looking at maybe redoing our rosé and figuring out some, a new, a new path for it. And you set up a new life for a rosé. And, uh, I had thrown out the idea of, well, what if we made a rosé that's in the same line as Eric's, you know, it could be Jordan's rosé. And, um, because it was my idea, uh, they decided to allow me to be in charge. And I had already shown a little interest in winemaking. I had made a Sauv Blanc um, the year before that was called four plus five because my dad had helped me make it. And he's the fourth generation and I'm the fifth. Um, but that was more like I made just enough for my wedding. <laughs> and then we had that wine at my wedding uh, for all my, my mother-in-law loves Sauv Blanc. So I made her a special wine uh, for the wedding. But um, after I had shown a little interest in winemaking, they're like, well, what about, what about you, Nikki? Would you like to be the, the Nikki to the Eric's? And um, my, my one thing was that I wanted to be able to make the wine rather than I, in Eric's situation, Carl made the wine for him. But in this one, I was like, I really want to be able to make the wine because I, Chardonnay might be my baby, but Pinot Noir is the love of my life. I, um, before working for Wente Vineyards, I worked for Flowers up in the Sonoma Coast. And that is one of my all time favorite Pinot Noirs. Um, I love their rosé as well. And so I, I really wanted to be able to, given, to be given the opportunity to kind of make the wine start to finish from growing the grapes all the way to pressing it out in the winery. Uh, and I was lucky enough that my family agreed and that the winemaking team was nice enough to let me barge in once a year and, and start telling them when I want to do my direct to press <laughs> Pinot Noir Rosé. Um, so I hope you guys will be able to try it uh, someday. <laughs> and for right now, they're not, they're, not letting, or they're not getting rid of it. They're not taking it away from me. So I still get to make it hopefully this year as well. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. So as, as we move into the, the last bottle uh, today, why don't you also, if you don't mind, give us some of your suggestions in terms of pairings. What do you, what do you like drinking these wines with? Yeah, um, I love drinking Morning Fog with like a rosemary chicken um, or with a nice like pasta seafood uh, with really light pasta seafood. So something with like a white wine. Sometimes I'll just pour a little of the Morning Fog in the sauce. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, and then with the Riva, I love how, like maybe something a little fattier, like a, a nice, rich, creamy scallop dish would be nice with this because it has that richness, but then also has some nice acids still left up in there. Um, or I honestly think that Riva is the Chardonnay for your steak eaters. Um, it can, because it is a bigger wine, it can hold up to a lot of different foods. I would probably have this wine with just about anything I'd eat and be very happy. Um, and then finally with my beautiful Southern Hills, this is my everyday red. I open this very frequently in this household. Um, and I think it goes really well with a nice pork or, uh, pork tacos are really good with it. Um, but just like a pork chop, maybe with some fennel, really beautiful flavors that come out from that and can accentuate some of the fruit flavors, but also bring in some of that green earthiness from the fennel. And I personally love a little bit of green in my Cabernets. I, that's just a natural thing for Cab to be a little bit green. And some people don't even taste it. I, it's just something that I look for in Cabernets. <laughs> I'm probably French somewhere deep down, not, not German, who knows? <laughs> but something I really love, and, and this wine I think also does a really good job at expressing the Livermore Valley because it does have that really nice acidity that kind of pairs well with that tannin that you feel that dries out your mouth a little bit, but tastes really fresh, you know, and that's what we're going for. We want this to be a wine that you can open up and have. It's, it's fresh, it's beautiful. It's, it's not too heavy. It's not going to be your meal. You know, we want this to be a food friendly wine that pairs well. Um, and we want you to get that nice fruit forward flavor, but we want you also to maybe have some tea leaves in the background that are making it more food friendly, not just gonna be this fruit bomb that comes at you. 
So I hope you guys can see that. And we do call it Southern Hills. We are very obvious with our naming um, because it mostly grows on the Southern Hills of the Livermore Valley. <laughs> and why we love the Southern Hills is because the way that the slopes face, so Southern Hills, you get that north facing slope and um, the wind is gonna come from the, east, or from the west through the, to the east and the sun is on the south hemisphere. So it's gonna go around the backside. So you're not getting too much direct, direct sunlight on those Southern Hills, which protects the, the fruit on a hot day. If you get too much sun, you'll lose color uh, and you'll lose berry volume. So we wanna make sure that we're protecting our vines. And we also love that nice breeze that comes through and just kind of ruffles all of the, the Southern Hills there. So it just has been one of the best spots for us to grow Cabernet and um, produces just some really amazing flavors that are a wonderful, wonderful wine to have with pretty much every meal. Probably not as much with fish. I don't know if I would pick this one out with my sea bass, but <laughs> definitely the other two. <laughs> nice. We do have um, one of our guests tonight, Donna, is asking, she must be very familiar with your winery because she's asking if there are any plans that share your Petite Syrah or your Cab Franc with New Hampshire. So we have some requests that we have to get Christian working on, I guess. <laughs> the Cab Franc is my personal favorite. I love that wine. Livermore just does a great job with Cab Franc. Um, I, the, the climate is like absolutely perfect to get it just beautifully ripe because Cab Franc can be really green, like much greener than a, a Cab Sauv, almost like turns you away, but if it gets perfectly ripe um, and that's what the climate here does, I I agree. You guys got to get the Cab Franc. The Petite Sarah is also very good, a lot of tannin, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I personally work on the Cab Franc first is my suggestion. <laughs> Come on, Christian. <laughs> I guess I can, I can put in a good word. <laughs> We'll so try and make more. <laughs> uh, Chad, I, I don't know if you want to chime in. We do have some of the other products of Wenty in our stores. So we have the um, Merlot Sandstone, a state grown in Livermore. And we also have the Riesling Riverbank. Uh, we mentioned the Morning Fog and, of course, Eric's Unoaked Small Lot, uh, the Riva Ranch. And then we have also your Sauve Blanc for uh, Louis Mel Livermore. Is Am I saying that correct? Or is it Louis Mel? Yeah. Louis yeah. Mel? Louis Mel, Louis Mel, I think it's. All the, all the same, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a good selection that you guys have there. Um, I Louis Mel is af named after the the winery estate I was talking about that is now Myriad as well. Um, the vineyards around that estate are mostly Sauvignon Blanc or Cabernet because the soils are just deep, deep gravel pits, and that's perfect growing conditions for Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet. And Mr. Louis Mel actually made the introduction to the Marquis at uh, Chateau Yquem in France uh, to get Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Semillon and Muscadel de Bordelais um, from Chateau Yquem and bring it to the Livermore Valley. Uh, his wife was good friends with the Marquis there. So uh, thanks to Mr. Louis Mel, that's where all of these, uh, or excuse me, all of our Sauvignon Blanc heritage stock came from. So we're very, very pleased with him. <laughs> And we have somebody that is a, a fan of Riesling and they're asking if you're reason, the Riesling that we carry. So just so you know which one it is, I assume, yeah. um, if it's a drier Riesling. Yeah, it's just off dry. So I think it's a really beautiful expression of Riesling. It is very minimally sweet, just perceivable. Um, I, it's a beautiful expression of just uh, wet stone. I don't think it goes too far into that like gasoline scent that you can get from Riesling, but it has really nice muscade sort of characteristics. I, I love that wine. It's a really, really fabulous wine. I highly recommend you try that one. Nice. So um, we only have a few minutes left, but I have a couple of easy questions for you. So one of the ones that comes to mind is when you're reading your website and looking at it, you have such a, an amazing diverse portfolio and a lot of it looks like it's mostly available on site. So it's great to, to know that if you head out there, you can experience it. What are the challenges that come with not only a family business, but five generations of family business? Because that must be challenging for you. Yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, to date, we really haven't had too many problems. And I think um, part of that is the no pressure to join. You know, they're like, hey, if you, this isn't your passion, we're not going to force you. You don't have to make it your passion. And that's kind of been the, the, the idea from the get-go. Um, and then I think the other part is that 
to date, no one has had the same job pathing. Like no one's been interested in the same thing. Um, the last person that was the vineyard manager before me and my family was my dad. So he is very ready to pass, pass the torch. He's like, I'm ready to go golfing. Who wants to come? Um, so uh, it's been really great that we kind of all naturally chose our own path. Um, my sister is uh, in marketing. My other sister is in project management for procurement. So um, sourcing new labels, you know, that sort of thing. Um, my cousin, Christine, is our charitable arm. So she runs our foundation for arts education. And then my cousin Carl is in winemaking. So we've kind of all just went our separate ways. And my, my other cousin, Bucky, who hasn't started working for the family yet, actually works for um, Southern Glaciers in Texas. Huh. So he's selling wine. And that's still another, a different direction. Like none of us are in the same path. <laughs> it takes a lot to, to run a vineyard, right? There's, there's a lot more to the business side than necessarily just the farming. So people don't always think of that. Yeah. And we're all going to have to draw sticks for who has to be CEO. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else that you'd like to share with our audience tonight in terms of the, the wines we've tasted or some of the ones that we haven't and that you'd like to talk about? No, I mean, I think that we, we went through a lot. I talk super fast, but I probably got in way more than an hour's worth of content. And I apologize if you guys like have this pre-recorded, put the audio on like like how to, however you slow it down, is that like 1.2 or is it the 0.8? I don't know. But um, I really appreciate you guys having me here. I mean, these are three of my absolute favorite wines that I drink very regularly. So it's always fun to talk about these wines and also to talk about my family. Um, I hope that you guys can eventually come out and visit us. Uh, I'd love to, to show you around the estate. Everyone on, um, we are arms wide open as soon as we can, can let everyone in again. Um, and yeah, we're I'm just really pleased that I'm able to show this, with you guys, share this with you guys in the new year. And Chad, I, I know that um, you've been able to put some of these wines on great discounts. Plus I believe there's an actual sale that the commission is running right now that makes this even more affordable for all pocketbooks. So do you wanna share any information on that? Yep. So for uh, this month, we actually did deep discounting on the Wenty wines. Don't tell Nikki. She might get a little upset about the pricing if she finds out. Um, but in addition to the deep discounts on these bottles, currently we are running our 15% off Cheers to You promotion, which is 15% uh, off 12 or more bottles of wine, any wines uh, that you would like, as long as they are in the 750 milliliter and 3750, 375 milliliter sizes. It's a great time. The cheers to you is, is our customer appreciation sale we do every year in this month. And uh, it's, it's a great deal for anybody that's looking to acquire some great wines at, at wonderful prices. So certainly don't, don't miss that opportunity. Um, well, that, that's our presentation. As everybody probably knows, um, our 90 Days Around the World events are replacing our distiller showcase, which typically happens early November for spirits. And then we also have the Winter Wine Spectacular, which normally happens in January. And so for the rest of January, we'll be focused on wine. So we have about another 20 or so events for the rest of the month. I hope you're able to join us. Nikki, I think you've been out here for Winter Wine Spectacular, right? I have. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it's quite the show. Uh, you know, if, there's a few glasses of wine that get poured that, those nights and, and people definitely Just get to <laughs> Hopefully we're able to come back to that in, in 2022 and, and really kind of have the fun with our consumers that we, we're used to having. Everybody also knows that joins us that we have a code word for Scavify, which allows you to open up those points and get those discounts and promotions. And the code word tonight is going to be face, uh, posted to Facebook. So you'll have to go to our Liquor and Wine Outlet Facebook page to grab that uh, code word. It'll be up there later this evening. And make sure you put it into Scavify so you can get those points. Um, and... That's it. Our program tonight will actually end on time, but thank you, Nikki. This has been a, a great learning experience for all of us. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me, and I hope to be back hopefully next year. Fingers crossed. <laughs> we hope so. Hope to see you then. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Nikki. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.